great. Thanks so much, Gene. Thanks so much, Mike. Uh, thanks to uh, Comcast Spotlight for presenting this and sponsoring it as well. And uh, Gene, how's that correct? We're doing things a little bit differently today. Usually uh, we sit up here and we give you a lot of information as far as just slides, but um, this is going to be unique. So it's a little bit of an experiment, so we'll see how everything goes. Uh, before we actually get started, who we are, uh, we are Talking Finger, a social media marketing agency, and you can see the pictures of us up there. I'm the handsome one on the far right, um, the one speaking, and Eric Granato is in the background answering your questions. So like uh, Mike and Gene both said, just uh, submit more questions and we'll answer them. All right, so purpose of today is we're trying to look towards the future a little bit. Uh, what are the ad opportunities to social media? What are the platforms going to do? Uh, to help people you know, spend their ad dollars a little more wisely and, and grab some more customers, uh, grow brand awareness, things like that. And we're going to go through a couple of the platforms, some of the things we're seeing first, then we're going to hit the questions. Now, first one I wanted to talk about, and this has been on my mind for quite a while, and the more research we do and the more we look into this, Google Plus is kind of, I want to say floundering as far as a true social network as compared to Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and some of the other big dogs. Um, it's really built up of entrepreneurs, um, things like that who are small business owners, people like that. The general user base isn't there. So the trend I'm seeing and for Google Plus to truly survive, I think they're really going to have to move towards what LinkedIn is. Um, it, it's built of people already who are self-branding themselves, very similar to LinkedIn. The difference is LinkedIn company pages, although they've been improved a little bit lately, they're a little bit weak. Google Plus has great business uh, pages uh, that really can be utilized well with integration with other social platforms. If this becomes true and Google Plus does make a move to be more of a competitor of LinkedIn rather than Facebook and Twitter and these other ones, the ad opportunities could be huge. Google obviously is the largest search engine in the world. Um, they control a lot of SEO, how you're found, how your business is found. If this becomes a case where Google Plus really embraces the people of LinkedIn, brings them in so that they have both a personal profile and can build a great company page around it, I think the uh, ad opportunities in this could be huge. Company pages, they're already kind of optimized for search. If anybody uses Google Alerts, you'll notice when you make comments or when you make posts to your pages, things like that, they come up high on Google Alerts. If this is the case, again, SEO could be turned a little bit upside down from being keyworded and meta tagged and all these other things for people to find you. And it will revert a little bit more to good content, which we're also going to get into that. Pinterest, um, a, while about, a while ago, me and Gene had a conversation where, uh, it was about three months ago, where I could have sworn Pinterest was probably never really going to allow advertising, but the more I read about it and the more I'm researching about Pinterest and some of the changes they've made internally, I, I'm, I am going to change my view on that and say I, I believe Pinterest will, within the next six months or so, will start allowing advertisers to spend some money there. Now, it's going to have to be kind of in the back end. Uh, Facebook has sponsored stories right now, which helps bring content organically uh, to where you could pay for it so it could be spread out a little bit more to the user base. I'm going to say Pinterest is going to go along the same lines. I don't believe they're ever really going to have ad space per se, where you can buy uh, you know, like a Facebook ad or ads on uh, like LinkedIn and stuff. I, I have a feeling they're going to move towards the, uh, the feed to where you can pay for your images or your content to be placed up in the everything category or be a little bit more searchable. And I think you're going to see that trend. So definitely keep an eye on Pinterest. Um, they have to monetize at some point. Uh, you know, in the past they would skim off using a, a website. They'd skim off any sales going through Etsy and such like that, and they've stopped doing that. So they do have to find a way to monetize, and I think um, – out of all of them, this is going to be the big one. This is the one I really think you should focus on and definitely uh, put in your Google Alerts Pinterest uh, and see what develops in this. Mobile marketing. Uh, I mean, nobody can deny that mobile marketing is, is becoming the next big thing. More and more people access sites, everything else through their iPads and uh, iPhones, even more so now than their desktops. They're mobile. Um, you're going to see a lot more opportunities. Now, Facebook um, is releasing or has released in a small amount uh, and will be a large amount later with having mobile advertising in the feed. Um, Foursquare has made a big play recently, uh, which is that little check mark. And anybody who's not used to, or doesn't understand or doesn't know what Foursquare are is, 
it's basically a, uh, a mobile application to search around you and find businesses and things that you can go along with user reviews, things like that. And it's also part of game. Uh, so people actually enjoy Foursquare. And there's other ones re related to Foursquare, but they've changed their platform recently for uh, advertisers and to start collecting better analytics and things. YouTube is making a big play towards mobile marketing. Um, there's some things on the horizon for them um, that they're really going to be integrating into their apps and such like that where uh, paid advertisers can really get their videos up near the top. Twitter has promoted tweets, of course, but um, they are far outside most of our budgets in the tens of thousands. But there are rumors about Twitter now um, looking more towards mobile as far as letting the small business owner get up there for the promoted tweets, so that stuff. Um, so definitely keep an eye on mobile marketing. That is going to be huge. Uh, more and more people access through that. Facebook. Um, I've been doing Facebook ads for quite a while now, and I really like what they're doing recently. They've been revamping the back end and the platform uh, to make it a little easier for advertisers to focus in on a, a more precise targeted audience. Um, they've also moved more towards organic with the sponsored stories, which I love sponsored stories. For us and several of our clients have really taken off very well as far as being able to get your content push through organic channels in the home feed and have it appear to people. Now, it's still an advertisement, but people on the other end who are looking at it don't feel like they're being sold to. And we're going to get into content shortly uh, and why content is so important as a part of your advertising. Uh, again, I said mobile ads. And analytics, uh, insights on Facebook are becoming deeper and deeper. Now, there's always privacy issues, so they can't give you like this person said this. Um, but they're getting a little deeper as far as being able to really understand who your target audience is and how they're responding to your, your advertisements. All right, and this is a big one right here. Successful advertising in social will requ require it to be in context with content. Now, what that means is social is one of those spheres where you, it's really hard to do a sale per se to where – hey, purchase this right now. It's more about engaging and making relationships with the end user more so than selling to them. Now, the selling comes as a benefit of this, um, but advertisements that aren't linked to good content do not work well. We'll get into that uh, as we go on with the questions. And I believe that's what we're going to do. Okay, so we're going to get into the question portion. And of course, uh, like we said early in the Q&A, definitely uh, post up any follow-up questions or anything else like that. It would be great. All right, so what can we expect to see from the major social media sites that's new and different? Well, I think you're going to see more and more ad opportunities as the social networks look to monetize their user base. Um, you know, some of these ones like Twitter, they're really meant for big big brands right now with the promoted tweets, but they do understand that there's a lot of small businesses that would really love to use Twitter as an advertising space. So definitely start looking for more and more of these uh, networks to shrink it down a little bit and make it a little bit more affordable for the small business owner. I think you're going to actually see more integration between networks as they look to the demographics of the user base. And what I mean by that is I really feel – coming up in the future, just from all the things I read and, and me and Eric research, that there's going to be a little bit of a trade-off between, say, you know, Facebook and Twitter of being able to use each other's user base to monetize. Now, this may not come to fruition. It just seems like that's the direction that they, they are going or they should go. Um, that way they can really target who the user base is for each one and obviously both make money on it. Um, I think you're also going to see more of the big dogs, do, big dogs purchase more and more platforms. I mean, obviously, Google is continually buying more and more platforms as time goes on. Facebook recently bought Instagram. Uh, I think you will see more and more so that they can integrate what the user base is into that and spread their demographics. App development. Um, you know, Facebook was a really good leader in this, in this case. They allowed developers to come into Facebook and create apps. Um, so, you know, Facebook got this whole kind of free developer program to bring developers in so that they can create apps. I think you will see more and more of the networks do stuff like this, where Google may allow some outside developers to create apps, Twitter, things like this. Twitter might be a little more difficult, but the, the major um, sites, YouTube, uh, has some developer products now, but I think you'll see that expanded as well. Um, so I think you will see a lot more user-generated type apps 
that will, of course, uh, bleed into more advertising use. Okay, let's see what the next one is here. What are the most important platforms to be familiar with? Is Facebook really not a good medium for advertisers? I don't think Facebook would be a successful media for B2B advertisers, particularly particularly small ones. Is this correct? Um, I'll disagree a little bit. Facebook is actually pretty good for B2B. Um, it's, it's one of the larger growing spaces on Facebook. And due to sheer volume, the user base continues to grow and more and more people jump on. And the demographics on Facebook seem to be spreading out a little bit more too as far as income, job titles, things like that. Um, the other thing is the future, it's kind of ingrained. Uh, you know, I have teenagers and my house is the house where everybody hangs out and everything else like that. And I see the way they, they interact with advertising and these social networks. It, these things are kind of ingrained in them. The same I kind of grew up with video games, and my parents would you know, look at video games and go, you know, what the heck is all this? Um, it's just ingrained in their DNA. They, they live by the, our, their iPhones, their iPads, all these other things. Um, and what's important to them is they don't want straight advertising. They want kind of user reviews to go along with that. They want to know what their friends think. They want the ability to learn more about something they will purchase. Um, so to set up for the future, this will be key, things like Facebook. And then whether Facebook's here uh, in five years or ten years, there will be another social network that will replace it just because this is the way that the millennials are all used to communicating and staying in touch. Um, again, it's all about the ads within content. Uh, that's very important that content is linked to advertising. Um, uh, Facebook's su successful for B2B. It's great for small businesses because it's relatively inexpensive. The largest portion of money you spend typically on, let's just say, Facebook is really time. Um, but if you streamline the time by creating good strategies, it does um, shrink the amount of time you have to spend to actually get somewhat of an ROI. Um, what platform? You know, specifically driven by demographics and who you want to target. Um, you know, a lot of people just jump on and say, well, I need to be on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, where that might not be the case. Um, you know, if you're targeting women, for example, you really need to be more on Pinterest. Pinterest is now it's around 70, low 70%, where it used to be like in the 80% uh, of Pinterest was women. Um, but, you know, that's the platform you need to choose. You choose platforms by demographics and your market research and finding out where your audience is way more so than just jumping on one just to jump on one. Okay, so let's see the next question here. As a B2B provider, what is the most efficient way to maximize the value of social media? You know, having a specific social media marketing strategy integrated with all your traditional and it's all built on market research. Um, this is kind of paramount. Um, you do not want to jump into social media and do it willy-nilly, you know, make a post here. The most efficient way really is to create a strategy. And the strategy is developed and changed through a collection of analytics. Um, you need to target the demographics through contextual ads. Again, content and ads need to go hand in hand. It's really difficult to make quote unquote sales through Facebook or sales through Twitter. It's more about engaging them. And if you do advertising, Facebook ads or LinkedIn ads or anything else, there should be kind of a tie-in between the content and the ad itself. So not only are you giving people a place to go to actually purchase, but you should be giving people a place to actually research a little bit more about that product. Uh, and then you rinse and repeat. Um, and, and that's how you really get an effective social media plan all together with advertising and your content is tied all together with a strategy. And reading analytics. I mean, you have to read analytics. If you don't read analytics, it's really difficult to ascertain if the ads and content are working the proper way. So the next question is here. All right, LinkedIn, I've been a member since 2008, and it's never produced any leads, and we have over 500 contacts. Seems to be a site joined to join just to say you're a member. Um, you know, one of the things about LinkedIn is people sometimes join, and they don't understand that it is still a social network. Groups, groups are really important, whether you start your own group or you join other groups. It's a social network. You must get involved and converse. You need to set yourself up as a thought leader. You have to be able to answer questions from a user base that may be interested in your product. Um, what you really need to do is you need to seek groups that have your potential customers and engage. When they ask questions, answer. 
we actually drive a good amount of business through LinkedIn just because we go into the groups where people are asking questions about social media marketing, and we answer. And it sets us up as a thought leader, and then eventually people move to our Facebook page. Now, we read a lot of analytics, so we kind of have a really good idea of where people came from to connect with us. Now, we drive a lot of our traffic, for example, to Facebook. So when I am conversing on LinkedIn, I usually will mention where it's in my profile or anything else that you can you know, learn more on our Facebook page or things like that. Now when I look at the analytics and I look for you know, one section which is called external referrers, I'll see that a ton of traffic has moved from LinkedIn to my Facebook page. So I know I'm doing something right on LinkedIn. And then those people hopefully will turn into clients or you know, somewhat of a majority of them will turn excuse me, turn into clients. Um, LinkedIn ads, they work well for companies whose target audience is there. Now, I'll be quite honest, I didn't find a lot of success in LinkedIn ads. Uh, we had a couple of clients who tried them who didn't find that great a success in them either, but I do know other companies have had great success with it. Um, so LinkedIn is one of those ones that you really have to determine your target audience. You know, you're looking for professional CEOs, things like that. And uh, if you can target your LinkedIn ads, they, they actually do work pretty well. But as far as producing leads, realistically, if you're not going to engage in groups and have conversations on there, you're probably not going to get that many leads because, again, it's built on a social network, and referrals are really important on that. Okay, let's see what the next one is here. Okay, how are advertisers valuing the activity on social media sites for their brand? Are there niche social media sites that work better for certain advertisers than the big ones like Facebook and Pinterest? Is MySpace really making a comeback? All right, so this is kind of broken into three parts here. Um, I'll, I'll start off to say this one thing. Things like likes and follows and all these other things, they're almost meaningless. And I don't mean that in a bad way because you know every like that we get on our Facebook page, for example, I enjoy seeing that like count go up. Um, it's a it's a good general way to look at growth, you know, as your Twitter grows and you get more followers, or on LinkedIn you get more connections. Um, but the days of it truly meaning something is kind of gone. Um, and I'll give you a couple of examples. When someone likes or follows, it will notify their friends one time, basically. Right? You like a page, so you just notify to all your friends that, that you liked it. If it ends there, those people have only notified their friends one time. However, if you can get them to continue to engage, they continually notify their friends that they're engaged with you. Repetition sparks interest. It's as simple as that. So the more they engage with you, the more signals they're sending out to the friends about you. Um, you know, one of the things, and, and that goes across the board for all of them. That goes for Twitter, everything else like that. There's always that friend value of when someone engages, it notifies their friends. Facebook specifically, there's an algorithm called Edge Rank. I'm not going to go into the heavy details, but it basically says what's valuable to show to a user and what's not. Um, so the more likes you get on your page but people don't engage, due to edge rank, your, their, your posts are actually hidden from them because Facebook determines that because they're not engaging with you, they're not worth showing your content. So this is why the, the, the mentions, all these other things, are great as far as one time, but it's the continual engagement that counts. And again, I'm gonna, always going to go back to content that has to do with good content. Um, the value in the metrics that show viral spread of content, the shares. Um, good analytics, you can capture more of the movement of people. Remember I told you earlier with LinkedIn, we can see that by conversing in groups. When we look at our analytics, we see that people move from LinkedIn to our Facebook page. Um, it's tough to get specific ROI figures still due to privacy functions on all this stuff, but we're moving in that direction quickly. So you'll be able to get more of what the value of the activity is as time goes on and uh, we have better and better programs and software that can really pinpoint exactly how someone moved from point A to point B to point C to become a purchaser or a buyer of the product. Um, so I hope that answers that, that first part. Um, excuse me. <clears throat> Are there niche social media sites that work better for certain advertisers than big ones? Um, niche sites are great for specific audiences. And yes, I mean, we do recommend to some of our clients to find niche sites. Uh, you know, for example, nonprofits can benefit from being on a, a site called Care2. It's C A R E and the number two. 
Um, you know, that's kind of geared towards nonprofits and philanthropists and all these other things like that. And it kind of works along the lines of Facebook. There are advertising opportunities on there, uh, things like that. So, you know, that niche site would be great to be on. Veterinarians should be on either Dog Store or Cat Store or Cat Store or some of these other niche sites that allow you to be in contact with specific groups. Now, time is always a factor. Um, if you only got a few hours to spend a week and you want to go into niche sites, but you're already on Facebook and you're getting good results and everything, just keep in mind one of the things about social media is that realistically you have to look at how much time you have and then determine as well how many platforms it could be on. Because if you only got a couple of hours per week and you're already on Facebook and you're already on YouTube and you're already on Pinterest, finding the time to go to these other ones might be difficult. And I'd rather, we always tell people, I'd rather you focus on a few that you can do well than be on a lot of them that you're kind of doing kind of half-ish, okay? Um, but niche sites, yeah, great. If you can find one that's good for you, definitely go for it. Um, MySpace. Um, you know, MySpace died. It came back a little bit because uh, musicians and artists saw a good niche over there. Um, but the relative lack of attention, it still has decent monthly traffic. It's been falling the past year and shows a little sign of reversing. Um, MySpace space had like something 26 million uniques in 2012, and that's down 30% from 37 just a year before. Um, so it, it's no longer the destination it was. Um, will it make a comeback? I, I highly doubt it. There's too many new um, platforms and networks out there right now that people are, are enjoying that it might be tough, but you never know. Never say never in social, that's for sure. All right, so how are advertisers using social media? Specifically, is this a selling tool, a retention tool, or something else? Uh, I'm going to say D, all of the above. You really have to, when you, you develop your strategy, the social media kind of functions for all of the above. Now, you can set specific goals. If you really want to say, we're going to use it as a selling tool, then great. Build your strategy around that, but just know that you can't directly sell because it's not going to work. It's, it'll become as an eventuality of good content and engagement. But don't sell directly. Um, retention, absolutely. It's, um, social media is actually... I feel, and just from my career as in advertising market, I really feel like it's one of the, the best way to retain a customer. Um, stats show that, and it depends on what, what publications you read, as a general mark, around 75% are more likely to buy from a business they've connected to on a Facebook, a Twitter, a YouTube, all this stuff, rather than their competitor. Social seems to create loyalty. When... You can do business with people you know, and that's an old adage, but it holds so true for social. People do business with people they, that they know. And through social channels, your customers, your clients, or anything else like that can really get to know you. Now, once you've built that rapport and that relationship, they're probably not going to go to your competitor to purchase. They're going to look for you. Uh, and that's why content engagement becomes so important is, is really for that retention. Something else, yeah, I mean, it's fun. Um, you know, one of the reasons I love social so much is I really think when you boil it down and we get past that it is a marketing tool, all this other stuff, I really like social networking. I think it's fun. It's, um, it's like being at a really good Chamber of Commerce meeting but online, uh, digitally. Um, you know, you build these relationships that a lot of times can turn into something in real life. Um, you know, there's people we've tweeted back and forth with or, you know, I've been on our Facebook page and, you know, we travel in New York City and all of a sudden there's that person and we've already kind of built a relationship. It's been digital um, and might have been on the phone once or twice, but it kind of comes to fruition. So, yeah, I mean, it's for all the above. Just have a strategy in place to really understand which way you're going. Next, how do how how do our okay? Well, that wasn't worded. <laughs> how are most advertisers executing their social media strategy internally with dedicated teams, internally empowering and educating all employees through the digital agency, through PR firms? Um, you know, it's a it's a great mix of all above. Um, content mostly needs to come from within. I'll start with that. The day to day, 
the what's happening in my office right now or what's happening in my manufacturing plant or what's happening at my, you know, the veterinarian office right now. The day-to-day has to more or less come from inside. Now, it's okay to have content writers and it's okay to have outside agencies help you curate the content and all these other things, but inherently content kind of needs to come from inside, okay? Now, content, again, is linked to ads. So, even with the ads and everything, it's all. It, you definitely want someone professional look at the ads, but the culture of the company needs to come out. So when people are writing your Facebook ads or, or doing a YouTube video, um, they really should be sitting down with you and understanding the culture of your company. So when they write these ads or when they produce these ads, they're capturing the essence of you. Um, because if they're going to do it the old-fashioned way um, where they're going to be making ads that are like banner ads or, or selling ads, it's just simply not going to work on social channels. The culture of the company kind of needs to come through. Um, now, as far as you know, other things like the employees, more and more companies are allowing employees to help with content because social inherently has to do with the culture of the company again. So we always suggest pick a couple of trusted people that have good personalities because remember, you know, social has to have personality to it. So you don't want to you know, find one of the employees who's really just kind of a stick in the mud. Um, you want people to have, even if it's the front office secretary, she's fun and bubbly and she has a good brain, uh, let, her, let her submit stuff. Um, so, yeah, empowering employees to um, produce content, and which, of course, then relates to the ads, is always a good idea. We do suggest, though, that you have one person in charge of the curation of it. Um, so it's a dedicated team that maybe submits everything, and the one person kind of disseminates everything. You kind of don't want four or five people to have access to your Facebook page or your Twitter and sending out all messages because branding becomes an issue in that case and the culture of the company uh, becomes watered down a little bit. So you do want one point person to curate everything, um, but be very open to expanding what that culture is or expanding what the, uh, the words they use. So yeah, I mean, you know, having employees submit stuff is great because it really spreads out who you're speaking to. Um, you know, digital agency, PR firms, um, I think they're best for strategy. It's really difficult internally to create a strategy because you're looking from inside your box. Um, strategies are best developed when people can step outside their own world, look from the outside in, and create a strategy. Now, that doesn't mean the PR firm or their ad agency or digital agency um, shouldn't be the main push. Uh, I'm sorry, that the, uh, let me repeat that. Let me change that around. It doesn't mean that the, the company... Uh, doesn't have a say in a strategy, but when you look from the outside in, it's a lot better to develop strategy because looking outside in, you, you see a lot of things that when you're inside the box, you just simply can't see. Now, for them to create a strategy, absolutely, they need to sit with you. Same as I said earlier with ads and everything else, a, a good digital agency or PR firm will sit with you and interview you and, and collect all the information they can from you. What are your demographics? Uh, who's your customer? Um, you know, what are the buying trends? Things like that. Uh, and then they take all those analytics and all those, that data they collected from you, and then they should be doing market research um, to try and line everything up to really define a targeted audience. Um, so they're probably best suited. So content and everything else typically from within, strategies and everything else typically should be done from outside, um, but they should always all work together. Okay, so next here we have, is it worth investing in the hot new trends, for example, Pinterest, or wait until they become more commonplace? Um, yeah. Yeah, it's it's not hot anymore, Pinterest, but it, as far as a startup, it, it's really strong. Um, you know, one of the benefits of investing in hot new trends is you're, you're typically the big fish in the little pond, which is nice, but time becomes a factor again. Um, don't forget, if you only have a certain amount of hours, it becomes a little more difficult to experiment. But absolutely, if you can invest in new platforms coming out, um, things like that that you read about, it's okay to experiment a little every once in a while. Now, most of the time when these new ones come out, like Pinterest, for example, and you know, some of the other ones, they typically don't have advertising uh, opportunities to spend money. It would be more about building a profile on there and starting to engage. Um, 
the way that most of these platforms come out is they kind of grab the audience first and then they monetize it. It's really difficult for these platforms and these networks to do it the other way around. You know, Facebook was brilliant with that. They got so many people on board and they really grabbed a huge audience and then they decided to monetize. Um, you know, same thing, Google Plus really hasn't monetized per se yet. Um, they will. Um, Twitter, same thing. They they really built it, and then they had to add opportunities with promoted promoted tweets and uh, all these other things. So um, it's worth investing if you have a little bit of time to spend, because time is going to be the the essence of this, not dollars. Because if you can't buy advertising space, the only other thing you could do there is engage. Um, so you have to decide which way you want to go. If it's worth investing or not, knowing that. You can't really per se buy your way in, but you have to um, have conversations in it to build it. Um, but yeah, if you can jump on, uh, it'd be great. Okay, next here. Is it too late to start a social campaign? Uh, no, no way, but have a plan. It's definitely not too late. Um, you know, I really feel in my heart after all these years of ad marketing, social to me is the future. Just when I look at the millennials and everything, how people converse and how they're staying in touch with and everything else. And again, like I said, Facebook could drop dead in the next five years. There will be another social network to replace it. It's simple as that. But uh, it's definitely not too late, but you do have to have a plan. Do me a favor, whoever asks this question, don't just jump into um, you know, creating a willy-nilly campaign and just jumping on Facebook to do stuff. Have a plan. Do market research. Um, research your target audience. Develop a strategy. Look at the analytics and then refine the strategy. Define what your goals are. Are you looking for brand awareness? Are you selling widgets? Are you trying to become a thought leader? All of these questions lead to where you need to be, what you need to say, and how often you say it, as well as what the content itself would be. Definitely not too late. Um, do a lot of research. Read. Um, there's a lot of things online that you can read about creating social media strategies, things like that. Educate yourself and really understand what the platform is doing, why you need to be on certain platforms before you jump into it. Integration of ads into content. Okay, this one was a really good one. Um, clutter issues, trends in ad spending. Um, absolutely. Content is king. I mean, I can't say that enough. Making a post on Facebook about a product and its benefits with a link to a YouTube video or a blog post about that product does so much better than a post that tells someone to just go to a website to buy now. Um, realistically, content and advertising goes hand in hand on social. Um, you know, even when we do Facebook ads, most of our clients when we do Facebook ads, they point to a Facebook page or they point to their YouTube channel or they link to a blog or something like that. And the reason is because people on social networks just inherently seem to want a little bit more information before, before they make any kind of buying decision. Um, so to give a little bit of background about the product or service where people can read content rather than uh, click on a buy now kind of thing seems to do better. Now, there's obviously um, exceptions. I mean, if you're selling T-shirts or, or, or um, tchotchkes or stuff like that, it, people kind of already understand it, what, what it is or anything else. So there's probably no need to. You know, an ad for a T-shirt can more or less just go to a shopping cart and stuff. But Things that are a little bit more complex or especially services and things like that when you're doing ads, they definitely should go to some kind of content. It reinforces who you are. It reinforces what you do. Uh, if you can send them to places where there's user reviews, that's great, and then let them make their buying decision. Simple as that. Um, clutter, uh, absolutely. It is an issue, no doubt. Um, you know, as time goes on, as more and more networks and more and more of these networks monetize, it is going to be more and more difficult to get um, the general population to be attracted to your ad. Um, but I think that social networks are, are pretty smart about this. They're pretty privy to it. Um, Facebook ads, for example, are becoming better and better re of reaching specific targeted audiences so that you're not really sending your Facebook ads out to just a general population, which you have the choice to, of course. I mean, if brand awareness is what you're looking for, then yeah, you might want a general blast out to the population. But as far as getting um, you know, some kind of ROI or hitting specific audiences, the ad platforms are getting better and better. Um, promoted posts, um, I think that was a great, smart way for Facebook um, to really 
integrate content into being an ad without it really being an ad. Um, you know, like I said earlier, my, my view will be Pinterest is going to go along the same lines. Um, these social networks, you have to remember, are a business inherently. And if businesses don't find ROI or they don't find that they're going to be getting money off of this, um, they're going to drop the ad dollars coming in. So they understand that clutter is an issue, and I think they're more or less on top of trying to get the clutter out of people's faces and getting them more specific targeted uh, advertisements. And a lot of it, again, is going to be built upon content being the advertisement. Um, trends in ad spending. Um, you know, I ran through a bunch of studies, and I always do. I'm always looking at, um, you know, as many studies and white papers and, and research things as I possibly can, and Eric as well. You know, we do a lot of reading and research. Um, you know, I, I think trends in ad spending for online, they're always going to go up for quite a while until there's something that replaces it eventually, um, if something does. But, you know, it's been about 10 to 15 increase per year on online all online advertising. That's including everything that has to do with online ads and advertising. Social advertising has actually been a little bit more. It's about a 15 to 20 percent increase over the last few years. Um, I think that trend will continue. If companies can start seeing it, it goes along with the clutter issues and the other stuff we were just talking about, but um, I think as time goes on in these these ads that we're putting out there tied to content um, get better and better and more and more targeted, I think you will see more and more companies start shifting dollars towards there. So I only see this trend increasing right now. Okay, let's see what the next one is. And that was it. Um, that's it for all the questions right now. Eric, did you have any? Um, Eric sitting right next to me, reading through. He's he's digitally typing and uh, answering all questions. Um, if anybody has any other follow-ups to any of this stuff, please feel free. You know, we'll stay on for a little while answering questions here. You can also go to our Facebook page. If you look at our Facebook page, we do engage and answer questions all day and night, and that's uh, simply facebook.com forward slash talking finger. Uh, definitely engage with us there. And uh, Mike and Gene, I think uh, that's it for right now, uh, unless anybody else has any other questions that are pertinent that needs to go. Do we have any questions coming in? Yeah, Eric's di diligently typing along here. Is there any questions that we should read out loud, Eric, that you felt were uh, important? Okay. Do you really need an in-depth social media strategy for small businesses that don't have a lot of history of social media? Okay, did everybody hear that? Do you want Eric to repeat it? There you go. Sure. Hi, everybody. This is Eric. I was the one typing all the answers to the questions in the background there. And uh, Veronica Garcia just shot me one here that I was just about ready to respond to. So. She asks, do you really need an in-depth social media strategy for small businesses that don't have a lot of history on social sites? The answer is simply put, yes. Here it is in a nutshell. I tell everybody this one. Um, if you ever went on a cruise, the best thing to do is before you go on the cruise, plan out the excursions so you know what's going on while you're, while you're at port. Social is the same way. Get a calendar. Monday we're going to do something on Facebook, and it's going to be this topic. And you're going to change the topics throughout the week. So by creating something simple, it's a daily planner. It cuts down on a lot of time. It allows you to think when you're not thinking so that you can add some ideas for future posts. And keeping on that schedule allows you to also track the ROI of your investment into your social time. So Veronica, absolutely. Uh, even something small of a plan is better than no plan at all. Uh, let's see what else we got here. So Debbie it all Hamilton. gets back to really your time, your time investment and tracking how that time investment pays out. Absolutely. You, you don't want to keep pushing out content that the audience isn't receptive to because, A, you're wasting time, B, you're getting unlikes or unfollows, and C, um, the goal is to entertain and have fun with it. So why not show that and do that so that you can in turn make some money with it. Um, so here we go. we got Debbie who's asking, she's looking, she was looking for a marketing job. Do you feel that LinkedIn is the way to go in order to get your brand out? It's definitely one of the ways. Um, Tumblr, Flickr, Instagram, I mean, depending on what type of marketing you do, like if you're, if you're a graphic designer, having a blog, a Flickr page, um, Tumblr, a, a Pinterest, there's so many different ways that you can go with it. 
You don't have to do all of them. You try and find what fits and use that as your billboard to show the world your skills. So LinkedIn is a great way to start networking. Reality is word of mouth and talking to people old school in this economy is the kind of thing that helps you get further into a job because you send a resume, you're one of a thousand people in the stack. So it's it's tough, but LinkedIn is definitely the place to go. Um, let's see here. Let me just read this. Um, I have someone saying they're going to follow us on Twitter. Thank you. If you have multiple products. Okay, here we go. This is a good question. Um, I don't know how to pronounce the first name that well, so I apologize in advance. Henrietta. That's how it? Oh, okay. Thanks, Bill. If you have multiple products, should you have separate Facebook pages for them or just stick it to one company? Good question. Um, I have a deli that we have here in Connecticut that's got nine locations, and we debated with do we do one board or do we do nine for each individual store. Walmart and Subway, they're, you'll see them do individual stores, but they also have the resources to handle it. In regards to multiple products, Wow, um, I wish I had a little more detail, but if you were a company that was only selling a handful of products, then creating a, a multi-page, uh, basically a tab on your Facebook page specifically, and have that content showcase all of your products, then only have the one page, because then it keeps the communication and focus, keeps the message in one place, and it doesn't confuse the audience so they don't know. Like if you're making stuff for boats, do you want a boat page for sailboats? Do you want a page for power boats? Do you want one just for luxury yachts? The best thing is to keep it all on one would be the simple one, and then disseminate the information from within. So let's see. Okay, Laura Foreman wants to know, can municipalities, state, and federal governments take advantage of social media? Would you recommend one over the other? Here's the answer to that. Everybody needs to be on social for some reason or another. Locally, we were working with a town in Connecticut where we are, and they had a big gripe over doing a Facebook page. And I told them, you guys are you know, eight years past the point of being an early adopter, so just do it and get it over with. Because for this little town, they can use it to tell the, the, the people in the town, hey, we got these fairs going on. We have these street festivals going on. Or more importantly, we're prone to a lot of negative weather up here in Connecticut, so schools are closing, things of that caliber. Now, on the state side, we work with a few municipalities where we started some of the, the classic see something, say something campaigns, and Twitter is an awesome tool to get your message out because when they do the reverse 911, if it happens at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, your home phone's going to leave you a message. You're not going to know about it. But there's a good chance that you're going to be interacting with social during the course of the day. And on your cell phone, your smartphone, you can easily get these tweets to let you know that water main break or something more severe. So absolutely the state and federal should take advantage of social because it's a, positive, it's a great way to make a positive message out there that doesn't have to be political but just informative. So let's see. Uh, Alicia Hill, any advice on using blogs as a form of social media marketing? You need to blog. Uh, too many reasons to list, but the big ones, number one is SEO. Number two, if you went with something like a blog spot blogger, Google owns it. So Google's, Google's going to favor it in its search results. Blogs are huge. They take time to develop. If you can write well and you're funny maybe, or you're intelligent or savvy, then you'll start to grow an audience. And one of the things that Bill might have talked about, I was too busy answering questions, is I, I kind of like to say your world needs to be like a wagon wheel where you bring everybody back to the hub in the center, that, and then the spokes are your different social media channels. So one of them's a blog, one of them's Facebook, Pinterest, LinkedIn, and you can keep going. What you do is when someone searches for you, all that digital chatter that's out there brings them back to one point, and it helps you. Blogs help you succeed in that quicker. Um, on the SEO side of it, a website is static. Once it gets crawled, it kind of doesn't get crawled much more. Where a blog, when it's constantly being updated or frequently being updated, it generates a higher SEO for you guys. And it also outbound links, which is critical. 
Let's see here. Do you suggest we keep Curtis, do you suggest keeping sites linked together? Sometimes I feel that it becomes information overload. It it totally is information overload and you absolutely need to keep them linked together because while it's information overload to you, there may be somebody out there, um, my aunt who lives in Minnesota, let's say, and she's 65. She probably doesn't use Facebook, but she's on Pinterest constantly. So the more social channels you have and make sure your message is a little different on each of them or spaced out so that you're not redundant in what you're saying, the audience can see the positives or the message that you're trying to uh, relay to them. So it's definitely vital to have multiple sites and link them together. For instance, if I see a company that has a Facebook, a Pinterest, a YouTube, and a Twitter, and everything else, I'm going to go on the ones that I want to use. Uh, like Facebook for me is my dominant one. I use it to get all my news. Twitter, it's I'll use, I proactively use Twitter. In other words, if something's going on, I search Twitter for it to be on, to get the news instantly. So by having all these different channels, you're allowing me, the end user, to pick and choose which one I want to engage upon. Uh, let's see here. Got a lot of questions. In regards to the um, MHART, in regards to the question about multiple pages, what if the products you are trying to promote are TV shows or videos, and each of those shows has a core group of fans? Now, this one changes my answer completely. If I am A and E or Discovery Channel, then absolutely you would want to have a different Facebook page for each channel. Um, sorry, each show. Absolutely, that would be. This is a, I'm glad this question came up so I can answer it that way. Um, John Selig, sorry if I axed your name there a little bit. Is it okay to place short blog entries on LinkedIn groups for B2B customers? That one I'm going to divert over to Bill. Hold on. Yeah, I mean, as far as LinkedIn, um, is it okay to place short blog entries on LinkedIn groups? Absolutely. If you feel like what you wrote about in your blog is information informational without selling yourself per se, absolutely. People go to LinkedIn groups a lot of times to get information or to be educated or find the latest trends and such. Um, is it self-serving a little? Of course, because you're getting exposure. But as long as you do these blog entries in a way where – you're giving information without selling. It sets you up as a thought leader, first of all, which is very important on LinkedIn. You want to be a thought leader on LinkedIn. That's where you get a lot of value out of it. Um, absolutely. Um, we post stuff on LinkedIn every once in a while. We don't overwhelm people. If I really feel like I have something important, uh, whether a slide share or a blog post, uh, I will go to a LinkedIn group and post it up there. Say, you know, here's, my, here's some thoughts about, um, you know, X. Or you remember earlier where I started, will Google become LinkedIn? Um, that would be a great blog to write and then post up on LinkedIn. Um, it's natural to the LinkedIn environment. I'm going to get some people who hate me for that. I'm going to get some people who agree with me. Uh, I'm going to get people who completely disagree with me. But, yeah, as long as it's not self-serving, absolutely. Um, I would definitely do that. Uh, let's see here. Facebook, Facebook strengths plus weaknesses versus Twitter strengths and weaknesses. Um, Facebook strengths, I think there's a large audience there that's pretty receptive to content if the content is good. Um, its weaknesses are you're also going to get a lot of ancillary people who are never going to buy a thing from you ever. Um, but I think that could also be a weakness for any platform. Um, Twitter strengths. Twitter strengths. I love Twitter. I love because you can be very succinct and give information with a link somewhere. Um, I always liken Twitter to I, what I call it personally is I call it text messaging on steroids. Simple as that. Twitter is basically text messaging. Uh, it's just been injected with uh, horse horse uh, adrenaline or something. Um, so it's really powerful. Uh, its weaknesses is. It's too succinct sometimes. Um, when people don't use Twitter the right way, you get a lot of like bits of information that don't really tell you what that link is going to do and stuff like that. Um, you know, this is a tough question that I'd really have to sit down and make a check mark for each one. Um, but as far as using it for advertising, you kind of have to look at demographics, what you want to say, things like that. 
Um, that's the best I can probably kind of answer that one. Um, trying, look, Brittany Breslin, trying to convince a restaurant, and this will be the last question. Okay, hold on. Actually, Eric's going to answer Brittany's question here. <laughs> Brittany, I was just about to type to you when Bill came up to it. So, all right, this is going to sound odd. Uh, Brittany's question is, trying to convince a restaurant client to use Pinterest as a way to share food inspirations, recipes, and network with other chefs, but can't get them to see its usefulness. What's the advice? This is going to sound odd, but every once in a while, you need to walk away from a client. Because if they don't see it, then you're going to waste a lot of time and energy trying to make them see it. And I've been in this situation, and I've had a walk. But one of the, Pinterest is food, fashion, and architecture. It targets a female demographic. Females dominate the page. Rumors go and statistics hover around 68 to 70% female audience. My wife... I, she used to yell at me for being on my iPad at night on the couch. I know yell at her for pinning too much. So she uses Pinterest to find recipes, to find cool things that she wants to cook. And when I started to see her building up this Pinterest love months and months ago, I started pushing it more on our food clients that we have. In this restaurant, what we started to do with one of our restaurants is pictures of what the place looks like recipes of what they had because no one can really make it exactly um another thing was showing pictures of the food up on pinterest and then you market that over to facebook or twitter you're cross promoting all of your social channels but i've seen people go when it comes to drinks when the, my clients put something up on pinterest and then put the same photo up on facebook or they tweet it it gets a lot of shares and engagement and it makes people salivate so if you start to mix Pinterest into your marketing message and you have someone who can a, a place where the food looks good and the environment's great and it's going to come out photogenically well then you got to push it on them a little bit. Um it's tough though. And you know I'm going to go back to the beginning if they don't want to do something and they're adamant about doing it then you might just have to drop it and walk from it. So and um Bill's going to follow up here. Hold on. All right, and this will be the last question, but uh, somebody asked it, and Eric had a great answer, but I want to extrapolate on it because it's very important uh, for advertisers. Um, Jason Callen asks, we're consistently seeing a low CPC, but also low conversion rate on Facebook advertising. Is this typical? Why? Seems great for visibility, but not for conversions. And Eric made a great answer with um, wrong message, wrong target demo. Facebook ads are a little different than online ads. Um, the messages that you would typically put in online advertising need to be a little different on Facebook. I spoke earlier about selling on Facebook. It just simply doesn't work. Uh, when we used to write Facebook ads, I'm going to say about mm, two years ago or so, um, we were doing it kind of, I'm going to call it the old-fashioned way, where um, here's our product, here's what's great about it, now go buy it kind of thing. Advertising on Facebook, there's three parts to it. There's the image, there's the title, and then there's the body of text. All three need to be in harmony. Okay. Now, when you write Facebook ads, and I'll give you a quick little inside tip here. When you write Facebook ads, when you are targeting a specific audience, and this goes across from a lot of online ads as far as, far as the methodology and everything, but the image that you use, first of all, Typically stay away from using logos. They're kind of mean, unless you're a big brand like Subway, logos are meaningless, so it doesn't attract the eye over there. Avoid colors like blue and white. Why? Because they get completely lost in the face. Facebook is made of blue and white. When you have ads or you have images that are blue and white, they get lost. Oranges, reds, yellows, they really stand out hardcore on Facebook in the image section. Um, if you're going to put people in there, have it focused in on the faces a little bit more. You don't want to have, you know, it's 110 by, I think it's 110 by 74, something like that is the, the pixel size of the image. It's a tiny little thing. So if you have faces on there and they're really far back, people are never going to see it. Um, and kind of avoid pictures of people if you can. Uh, it works for some things, but because people put so many pictures and images up there of people, those kind of get lost. Now, the title and the body, 
whoever you are targeting, and when we say when we write Facebook ads, we don't just write one Facebook ad. We write six or seven for the exact same thing, and we do the A-B testing kind of thing. And if you're not familiar with A-B testing, I'm not going to get deep into it, but it's comparing which ads are working and which ones are not. Um, but um, the title of the, art, of the ad needs to be have the keywords that you are using for targeting. So if you're targeting, let's just say women, Okay, somewhere in the title has to be the word women. The body of the, the ad, it, it's really important that you give a teaser to go somewhere to look at something. Don't, unless it's a t-shirt, I said this earlier, if you're selling t-shirts, nobody cares. Just put in, go to, send them to a buy site. But if you're selling a service or something like that, the body of the text should kind of just give them a little teaser about uh, the benefits of it maybe, things like that, not selling it, but hey, Go to our YouTube channel to learn more or, or visit our Facebook page to learn more. Things like that are way better served than um, just saying buy this. And you will see the, the conversion rates go up when you put all that ad stuff together. And Mike and Gene, we're out of time, uh, I know. And if anybody has any follow-up questions because we're going to be closing this up soon, uh, go to our Facebook page and feel free to pop it on the wall. And Mike, Gene, uh, really appreciate the time. Hope everybody uh, enjoyed and learned. 